So let's start with the third lecture by Sasha. Welcome back. So I will uh, start because I, there are so much already materials that I'll just remind all the notations and what we have done. So we're discussing the uh, universal infrared structures of gravitational theories and asymptotically flat spacetime. And uh, recall, let me recall some names. So this is a Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. It has null infinity where the light ends. It's called scry, scry plus, and scry minus. They are labeled by retarded time or advanced time, which runs along this edge, and point on the sphere Z and Z bar. Uh, this point Z and Z bar, if you look in the usual normal Minkowski coordinates, even though this is the same letter, in the, in the normal coordinates, it's uh, uh, the same point, the same Z and Z bar on scry plus and scry minus are antipodally matched. So if it's a North Pole, that's a South Pole. And that's a relation to usual coordinates. Then we uh, studied the question of uh, scattering and uh, uh, looked at the structure of space-time far away. So when distance goes to infinity, when we approach scry. And we uh, uh, have a natural one over R expansion. Here the first line is the usual Minkowski space in retarded coordinates. Uh, Z and Z bar is a metric on a sphere. And then we introduce uh, corrections. There are, say, uh, three of them. Let me remind you. This, this MB is called uh, mass aspect. And uh, remember, it was related to the mass of a space time and the loss of energy as uh, the radiation, as radiation goes, goes th through. So uh, this uh, CCZ does not have a name, but uh, its derivative has a name, which is a new tensor. And uh, it describes gra gravity waves uh, at null infinity. And then we uh, um, discussed uh, the so-called angular momentum aspect. And uh, by solving the constraints or Einstein we, by looking at Einstein equations, uh, say GUU or GUZ component, we found equations of this type. The first derivative and, uh, of M mass aspect and angular momentum aspects are fixed up to integration constant. So we end up with a picture that the, uh, the data uh, that we have to specify at null infinity is uh, characterized by the new tensor and this three integration constants. Uh, then we... Uh, discussed a little bit that uh, the, there is a matching. So this uh, I plus plus and I plus minus, as you go uh, to very late or very early times uh, on scry plus or scry minus, this is denoted I plus plus, I plus minus. And we uh, discussed that fields are here uh, naturally matched, which was this anti antipodal matching. This is this equation. And then uh, uh, we wrote, um, these charges, uh, which, uh, which are given in terms of this uh, integration constant mass aspect and uh, this angular momentum aspect. And uh, these charges are labeled by arbitrary function on the sphere here, this F, C, and Z bar, or some vector field y, uh, y A. And uh, if we combine this, uh, this antipodal matching with these charges, we got constraints on the scattering data of the type that if we integrate uh, something over scry plus, uh, we get a formula of the type flux plus memory is equal integral over a minus flux plus memory. And in the case of uh, this uh, mass aspect, the flux was a flux of energy. So this corresponds to the QF describes energy flux. And QY is related to angular momentum flux. And uh, this memory is, uh, in this case, it's a usual memory. and this, it's so-called spin memory. It doesn't matter. So that's, uh, this is uh, this infinite set of uh, conservation laws, 
which uh, relate uh, what you observe, or say this initial data that you prepare, what has to happen at Scry Plus. Now, uh, yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah, yeah, so. Yes, yeah, so let me repeat the question. The question is, uh, if this data is enough to describe uh, massive particles, it's the first part of the question. Second part, if it's known, uh, how to describe them uh, in general. So uh, the answer is the first question is no. Here I assume that there are no massive uh, uh, particles. Uh, so here everything is uh, massless. And uh, so massive particles, which start their life here and, and here, uh, I set them all to zero. So that's the answer to the first question. And uh, regarding how to do, is it known how to describe them? Um, well, here they will be encoded, uh, the state of massive particles will be encoded in the values of uh, mass aspect at this. So here I recall I dropped boundary constants here. Um, so all this, uh, the, I assume that space-time starts here in a trivial state and ends. And uh, um, in general, if there are massive particles, this will be non-trivial. And uh, uh, I guess a more physical or better way also, one can choose a different gauge and different slicing of Minkowski space to sort of resolve this point, which is a bit singular, in this coordinates. So this coordinates not suit very well. Um, now. Uh, having described the charges today, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, symmetries they, they correspond to and, uh, and uh, relation to soft theorems. And then end with uh, further results and comments, which will further results. So. And no, no, notice that uh, the, the path we are taking is like the opposite of the historical one. Uh, historically, uh, this is what is, was known from the 60s, and this is what is a recent development. But I chose a simpler or more straightforward path, which is we first define charges. And now I will review this old subject of symmetries in asymptotical Minkowski space. So if there are any questions about that, but let's. Yes, OK. There seem to be no questions. Um, yes, and another little comment is that today uh, some of you might have seen that uh, lectures by Andy Strominger appeared uh, online. And you can find there are many details of uh, what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, actually, a very nice and concise version of, of many of the formulas you can find in the uh, sections two and three of their last uh, paper was Hawking, where they just review all these things. Okay, so let let me proceed now to the uh, to the symmetries. The the relevant uh, notion that I will be discussing is known as a asymptotic. Uh, asymptotic symmetries or uh, asymptotic symmetry group. And the idea is that, as uh, we know, that uh, general relativity is invariant under diffeomorphisms. And as we saw in the first lecture, there is a redundancy in the description of it, of the graviton field. And uh, uh, we can consider diffeomorphisms which are generated by some vector field. Um, Mu. And then uh, if psi mu has uh, some compact support, uh, and uh, it, uh, we can imagine that it has some compact support and doesn't act non-trivial and asymptotic data. In this case, this is a trivial transformation. However, we can imagine also gauge transformations which do not uh, die at infinity. And if they do not die at infinity, they can act non-trivial on the physical data of the theory. And these are non-trivial physical transformations. And the idea would be that the charges that we discuss are exactly of this type. A uh, little bit more precisely, what we are doing, what we are asking for is the following. 
as I described this as a bonding gauge, so we fix the gauge. And uh, moreover, uh, this was by itself, uh, this was by itself a trivial step. A little bit less, less trivial step is that following all the results, we figured out the falloffs. By this I mean, uh, for example, the, the facts that um, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, behavior of the, of the metric at uh, at far at large r, then we have uh, this is uh, simply a rewriting uh, of the same thing that it behaves say minus one plus four to one over r. Uh, and uh, UR is uh, minus one plus over R. Um, GUZ for one. And GZZ is of order R. So GRR equal to GRZ equal to zero. Now we can ask the following questions. Ask, find all the, all the vector fields that uh, generate uh, if you have morphism such that they preserve the bonding gauge and uh, they preserve the falloffs. This solution, this problem is now completely well defined. You can take, uh, uh, recall that if you have some metric and you do a diffeomorphism, the metric transform the lead derivative and you get the formula of this type and coordinate system. Um, so you can now, in principle, go plug everything I told you and find what are, what are the vector fields. You might have uh, heard the, the famous analysis of this type is that if you, you this, uh, the result will depend on which asymptotic you approach. So the, 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 the well-known the well resu result is that if you consider some spatial slice and you analyze the symmetries close to spatial infinity, as expected, you... Uh, you recover simply this uh, vector fields that uh, generate Poincaré transformations. Or even simpler, in QED, you can repeat all the same words, and you will recover that uh, the set of large gauge transformations is just a U1, and this corresponds to conservation of charge, which is asymptotic symmetry at spatial infinity. So the, uh, the result, a very unexpected result of uh, BMS in the 60s was that if you repeat the same analysis close to null infinity, suddenly you find, instead of just the usual Poincaré group, an infinite dimensional extension of it. And uh, so that was a very, uh, that was very unexpected, and uh, for many years it was not completely clear what is, the, what is the use of this fact. So let me describe this, uh, this infinite dimensional extension of the of the, um, of the Poincaré group, namely this BMS, uh, BMS symmetry. So the idea is that uh, if you consider the following, uh, following vector field, so it is uh, this, well, as you might already guess, this, this F is exactly the same F that we had in the definition of the charges. And these charges will be nothing but generator of super translations. Uh, if you take uh, this vector field and uh, uh, do the computation, you'll find that you'll find that uh, the follows are preserved and uh, and uh, for any function of f. If f is equal to the uh, if um, if f is equal to uh, zero uh, low harmonics, namely if it's a constant or uh, lower powers than z, this are just the usual the usual translations. It will be z. C to bar, Z bar. Uh, 
And, uh, but in general, this can be arbitrary function. Now you can, uh, uh, by computing the linear derivative, you can find how the, uh, the fields transform under, the, under this transformation with the, with the following result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry? Um, okay, sorry. I have. I should have. Uh, I should have four of them. So uh, there is a there is a one here, and I think maybe maybe let me write it like that. So this is a, so this is a one parameter. Then uh, this is a complex number. So it's two. And there is uh, there should be one more here. I don't remember exactly what, uh, so let me just write it, uh, C1 here like that. There might be a factor here, one minus the z bar plus z bar, but so there is one, two, three, four, because this is a complex conjugate of each other, yeah? Yeah. Well, uh, since we are looking asymptotic, uh, at asymptotic symmetries, we, uh, uh, we are only interested in the part which acts non-trivially on the asymptotic data, and I believe that all the, not all the subleading parts will just act trivially. So they're within the equivalence class. We can add whatever we like. Okay, so uh, let me repeat the question. How can we generalize uh, uh, Poincaré symmetry to something larger uh, if, since we have uh, a Coleman-Mandula theorem? So let me remind you first what Coleman-Mandula theorem is. Uh, the Coleman-Mandula theorem asks the following question. Imagine you have a non-trivial theory with an S matrix. What are the, uh, the maximal set of, maximal extension of the symmetry group? And uh, the result that, uh, that the maximal extension is, uh, is just either Poincaré or supersymmetry, direct product with some internal, internal symmetry group. Well, there are some technical assumptions, but they are completely innocuous. Something, we assume that, say, there is a, there is a, for each mass, there is only a finite number of particles with mass lower than the mass. So there is no accumulation point in the mass. And the answer to this question is that uh, we haven't, uh, um, uh, well, in, uh, if, this would, uh, if this would be a, a, a symmetry of scattering amplitudes, that would be a problem, but uh, these generators actually, they do not annihilate the vacuum. So it's not a symmetry in, of the S matrix in a coleman mandula sense, so there is no problem. And the implication of this, um, well, sometimes people say that, okay, this, they, don't, they don't annihilate, yeah, these this, this, this charges that we consider here, they do commute with the S matrix, but they do, do not annihilate a vacuum. And in coleman mandula I believe they, it was important to assume that um, the charges, they not only commute with the S matrix, but also annihilate the vacuum, because the idea of the coleman mandula is basically that uh, if you have a too much of a symmetry, you can imagine you have a, two particles that scatter, and uh, imagine you discover some great symmetry which relates scattering like that, which allows you to move wave packet. Then you can say that the scattering head-to-head -head is the same as scattering far away, but scattering far away is zero, so scattering is trivial. But here what happens is that, uh, and it was important that the symmetry generator rel relates two-to-two -two scattering to two-to-two -two scattering again. Here, uh, since this uh, generators they do not annihilate the vacuum, the, the relation is different. It relates two to two scattering to a different scattering amplitude where you have a different number of particles, which is that you have an insertion of a soft gravity. So that's, uh, that's the answer. Yeah, you can say that. That this, uh, well, the, it's a little bit subtle, so I, but they, this is spontaneously broken, but we, um, 
let me let me put, let me leave it that way. But even though you you can probably complain um, about this uh, the statement. Um, okay, uh, now uh, uh, let me write uh, how this uh, transformation how this transformation acts on the fields. So you can compute the uh, transformation of the fields, and uh, um, it's uh, simply like that. Acts as a derivative on, um, and here is this is maybe the most uh, the only thing that you should maybe remember from, or is the most important, is uh, this. So uh, remember that uh, we discuss this uh, this uh, asymptotic data in terms of NZZ and this integration constants. So if you start with Minkowski space where NZZ is zero, and you do a super translation, NZZ stays zero. But you get a shift of this integration constant. So it moves you in this uh, space of integration constant. Well, and uh, there is some transformation of uh, mass aspect. Uh, well, again, it's maybe the important thing is that if you start with some, some Minkowski space and uh, where mass aspect is zero, you still get zero. So the, if, you, if you act on a, on a vacuum, you get a shift in this uh, uh, integration constant of CZZ. If you act on some uh, scattering data, you get different physical scattering data. Things arrive at different times. Uh, so notice that uh, if, you, if you imagine that the usual translation, the usual translation uh, translate the whole space time, here we can translate independently along this time u uh, at every angle independently. So it's sort of trans independent translation at every angle. That's, um, uh, that's, uh, 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 that's the effect of this um, transformation. And uh, we can expand f in this function f on the sphere in a set of harmonics. And this, all uh, these vector fields uh, commute with each other, so we get an abelian group of these super translations. And what, uh, um, and what uh, in the 60s uh, people found that there is this BMS group is a semi direct product of super translations uh, times uh, SL2C, I guess, over Z2, which is just the Lorentz, Lorentz group. So this has a usual Lorentz. Formations. Um, okay, so this is a simple uh, this is a simple extension, and uh, as uh, uh, as we will discuss a little bit, uh, then what happens is that now we have a, a asymptotic symmetry, which is a, a large gauge transformation which acts on trivial and asymptotic data, while preserving all the follows. Then uh, if we formulate our theory canonically, so if we try to quantize it using well, some usual language of phase space, symplectic structure, et cetera, there will be associated charge, which, which acts while acting on the field through the Dirac bracket, generates this transformation. And uh, uh, the result is that this charge QF that we discussed, it exactly does the job. Yeah. Yes, that's the next subject. So it's a, it's a, so this we, we discuss uh, now super translations. Uh, they are they are they are uh, so they are they are generate the cell to C. So they they uh, they they extension of a cell to C. So this is a normal BMS, and this wise it's an extended BMS, and this wise it's what's called super rotations. That's what I would like to uh, discuss next. So this is uh, this were, this is what is called uh, super translations. So you can think of it as this uh, angle-dependent time translation. It acts on the field the following way in the following way. And most important is there is a shift in the integration, or maybe not most important, but there is a shift in the integration constant quite curiously. And uh, 
Again, uh, we will further see that this, uh, the word identities due to these charges corresponds to uh, Weinberg's soft theorem. But that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is, there is a way, and uh, uh, well, people did it, I think, even some. But uh, I, I don't quite know what would be the invariant meaning of that. So, and, but in principle, I would imagine that one can try to do that. Um, yes, yeah, there was this paper by Geoffrey Compare. Uh, they were discussing, and they were discussing that if you try to extend this transformation to the whole space time, there are some defects. But it's, I think the story is not completely settled, I would say. Maybe, maybe you wouldn't agree, you know, but that's my, that's my impression, that yes, we can try to extend them, but it's uh, not completely clear what's, what is the meaning of that. Even though, I guess, in the context of semi-classical space-time, when we have a black hole or something, that's, that one, one, one can try to do that and discuss what are the effects. Any other questions? Okay, these were, these were super translations, and now, uh, uh, as, uh, yes, in the canonical formalism, this super translation will be generated uh, by, by the Dirac bracket with this charge QF that we discussed, or in quantum theory by a commutator with this QF. That's uh, the relation to the previous discussion. And, uh, uh, the, the other charges, uh, they are a little bit more exotic and uh, much more subtle, uh, the, which are related to this um, uh, y, y A's. And uh, similarly to, to this story, well, let me maybe start here. You can consider, again, um, uh, another vector field which takes this time the following form. Uh, one plus u over two r y z dz plus uh, not very illuminating probably but uh, the only intuitive connection is that uh, that's how, how boosts and uh, rotation look at null infinity. If you rewrite uh, boosts, uh, well, there are, there are other terms, but let me spare you from this. From that, you can look at them up in many places. Uh, well, so it, uh, it acts on the sphere. And uh, the interesting thing is that, so remember the rules of the game is that we have a bonded gauge and we have a fall-offs. And uh, um, if you do this exercise, remember we have this uh, ZZ bar component, which is R square, and this is fixed by the asymptotic structure. We don't want to change that, say. But if you do the tr this transformation, you find that uh, uh, the, the ZZ bar component translates um, like that. Square Z. Z bar, Z, Z, Y, Z bar. So it's very simple. You see, the, the important fact is that it's R square, and uh, we have a DZ over Y, Z bar. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, something that we would like to set to zero for, to satisfy these conditions that we preserve the fall off. And that's what, what BMS did. So as you can imagine, that you can have any, any holomorphic uh, vector field here. But uh, what BMS also did is that they say, OK, we would like it to be regular on the sphere. So if you compute the norm of it, it you don't want it to blow up. And if you write down all the vector fields uh, that's of this type, you find exactly six of them, which is, uh, well, it's trivial a little bit, but uh, so we have i. Squared. And these are just rotations and the boosts. Uh, 
Uh, now in 2009, in the paper by Barnish and Chouassar, of course, it's uh, is, uh, inspired by this fact that in uh, two DCFTs, uh, we also have uh, holomorphic transformations. And we know that it's extremely powerful and they completely govern the quantum theory. Everything transformed in the representation of Virasoro. We have word identities. Basically, it's a symmetry of the quantum theory. They say, okay, why don't we uh, think locally and just find uh, the solutions, all the solutions of this equation locally? And now you see that you can take any holomorphic function you like that uh, locally satisfies this equation. And they say, why don't we, uh, well, actually, I don't know if they say that, but the idea was that maybe we should take it seriously and maybe there are some non trivial. Um, implications. And uh, even though probably after some time this it's not exactly the way you should think about this, but uh, it happens that this is right and uh, this charges, uh, this charges of um, this other charges labeled by Y, or exactly the charges that generate uh, this symmetry with holomorphic Y. So that's, that's the interpretation of the other charges. Now let's, uh, let me uh, a little bit elaborate, write similar formulas um, as uh, I wrote here, how, how, uh, how the field transform under super rotations. And uh, the, let me write only one formula. So it's, um, again, some, uh, some things which you might forget, but uh, there is a piece which, is, uh, which you can uh, probably keep in your memory. So there is a transformation of this type. And then most importantly, there is, a, there is this um, homogeneous homogeneous space. So there is this importantly third derivative on the, of the y. And uh, well, there are a couple of ec exciting things. I guess in certain coordinates you can rewrite it and it looks like transformation of a 2D stress tensor. And uh, you know, people were wondering what it means. And recently there were several papers where people tried to construct out of this new object which transforms like stress tensor and whose insertions uh, look like word identities of 2D stress tensor, but there are many, uh, well, there are many issues with that or some issues with that. We can d maybe discuss it during the discuss discussion session. Um, so important uh, thing is that if you take the YZ to be just the Lorentz transformation, this third derivative is zero. And if you start with a vacuum where NZZ is zero, you end up with a vacuum. On the other hand, if you start, uh, if you start with, um, uh, yz, which is, uh, is this part of a super rotation, um, then you remember something that uh, was important that we were saying that the phase space that we're considering is such that nzz is some function of u, but it falls at large and uh, early times as a function of u, so that we can integrate it, and uh, the limit of czz. Remember, CZZ was the integral of a du of NZZ. It exists. But here we see that if we start with a vacuum, we transform, NZZ becomes a constant. And if you integrate it with U, CZZ blows up. So it takes, this transformation takes us away from the, from the phase space. Uh, well, one, another simple exercise uh, to see what happens is that, um, you can take, a, if you take a cosmic string, which is a solution of Einstein gravity with a defect, uh, it is a topological defect. You have Minkowski space, and the only difference is that you have, a, uh, if you go around the, this cosmic string, you, you have to identify phi plus two pi, say, minus some delta. So there is a, you, we cut, cut off the slit of a space-time. Uh, when you compute, uh, when you, compute uh, you can take a metric of a cosmic string and put it in a bonding gauge, 
And you will find that uh, the new tensor um, is holomorphic as here, but it is, uh, it is singular. <coughs> so it has this kind of form, one over z square. This is an example of a space-time which, if you wish, is super rotated, and it, indeed it's not asymptotically flat space-time. It's what is called asymptotically, asymptotically locally flat space-time. So if you look, if you go everywhere on the sphere, it looks like Minkowski space, but there is a global effect. Um, so super rotations, they, they have this feature that uh, they, they act not in the space of asymptotically flat space-time, but in some extended space. And, uh, uh, which presume, uh, but uh, this was not uh, worked out or anything. So at the moment, uh, this, uh, the way you think about the super uh, rotations, we study, we have the charges, and then we, we study the word identities of these charges. Um, and, uh, and they do correspond to this so-called subleading soft theorem. That's, uh, um, I think that's uh, status at the moment. Moreover, notice that um, uh, why, why uh, another comment is that, um, again, as we're discussing, that there is a set of charges and they correspond to soft theorems. And now we hear, um, uh, we discuss the super rotations. Um, uh, and then there will be a corresponding soft theorem. One of the, as we discussed, uh, the, the thing about this triangle, you learned some connections, then you can try to extend it, and what people realized uh, quickly is that this uh, subleading soft theorem, it actually exists in any number of dimensions. It does not only exist in four dimensions, but in any number of dimensions, whereas this story was holomorphic transformations of the sphere, they, are, they only exist in four dimensions, and. Uh, I'm telling you about this uh, super rotations and how they were discovered, but uh, in higher dimensions, we clearly we don't have a two sphere, we don't have this holomorphic transformation. And uh, I think there, there was a paper by Campiglia and Lada who identifies the symmetries in higher dimensions as some smooth diffeomorphism of the conform of sphere. Um, but uh, somehow this connection to uh, two dimensional uh, conform of transformation on two dimensional sphere and two-dimensional conformal field theory seems to be an important inspiration for the subject, even though it's not, as you see, there are many, uh, maybe, questions uh, about that. Now I would like to uh, switch to, uh, to, so this was a description of symmetries, uh, and we discussed the charges, and now I would like to quickly describe uh, how to think about um, soft theorems and uh, write them down and uh, discuss and make further comments. Are there any questions at the moment? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the qu let me repeat, uh, repeat the question. It's a very good question. Uh, how do we, I wrote an action of a charge as some Poisson bracket. How do we define a Poisson bracket? So this is a very long subject. Uh, there are many, many papers, many experts, and many subtleties. But the idea is that we constructed a f uh, we constructed a phase space, and now we should find a symplectic structure. And uh, I believe the first it was done in the paper by Cernkovich and Witten in 1986, and then Bold had uh, developed it. So the idea is that uh, there is a more or less a canonical way to find a symplectic structure. And then you can uh, um, just uh, follow the, the set of steps, which is pretty standard, and uh, find, uh, uh, find this, this action. So the, the Poisson bracket is, will be controlled by, if you, know, if you construct symplectic structure, you can compute the action. The subtle part about this is this, what I'm saying is not quite, um, it's not quite, uh, I think, fair because uh, here the, whole, the, subtle, the subtlety of the subject comes from this uh, sort of soft modes. And uh, originally, uh, when here I um, uh, write as a phase space this NZZ and this integration constants. And uh, in, uh, I think in what people did until recently, they, this integration constants were not included as a part of a phase space. But they are responsible for this soft part of the action of the charge. And uh, 
again, from talking to people, my impression that at the moment, the way people extend this phase space to include the soft mode is basically driven by the soft theorem intuition. So we derive a soft theorem, so we know um, uh, how things should act, and then you, uh, you take this, uh, your, uh, your uh, symplectic structure and the way it acts on the field sets at non-zero frequencies, and you assume certain continuity things, but uh, there is no, I think, a principle or theory of how to do that. People just did that and write down more or less uh, the, the, uh, this bracket for which generates correct results. I don't know, there should be a much deeper mathematical theory and uh, understanding of that. Well, uh, so we used, uh, we used uh, some of the Einstein equations to identify what is the data. Yes, and that, yeah, definitely, sorry, yeah, 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 definitely, you, to, to construct the symplectic structure, you, you use Einstein equations, yeah, yeah, sorry. Maybe that was your question. Yeah, that would be the idea, but of course we don't know how to do it non-perturbatively. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Well, I think perturbatively actually there is a, well, it's all sort of. That would be the ideal. Yes. Uh, the, so the, the, this fantasy of field theory uh, of living at infinity it requires, uh, I would say two main ingredients, which is locality and unitarity. And uh, I think in this story, it's pretty clear that unitarity is gone. Whatever 2D CFT it is, it's definitely not unitary. And uh, locality, maybe there is some hope. But even this is very, it's very, it's very uh, exotic if you, if you look at it. Other question? Ah, yes, uh, very good. Uh, Maybe uh, uh, because so far I haven't uh, uh, written a correlator uh, of which looks like a correlator of 2D CFT. I was going to do it next, but let's say we let's say we we, we managed to write this correlator, which is a which uh, which is a scattering amplitude in this case, and then we compute that, and then in a unitary theory it should be decomposable in representations which satisfy unitarity bounds. So what people did they computed these things, and what you get is a so-called principal series, or completely different representations, which do not look like the usual CFT. Moreover, they're continuous. It's not a discrete spe spectrum. The reason also issue is singularities. But uh, when I mean non-unitary, I mean that if we take this uh, as a correlation function on the, the two-dimensional CFT, and we look at its uh, representations that propagate, they are not the usual representation. The spectrum is continuous. They, they have complex dimensions. Now, uh, let me uh, relate and uh, so uh, relate this to something very simple and to this soft theorems. And uh, the basic idea is, uh, uh, let me, I, I, I like this uh, little fact, which is not, uh, at least I haven't seen it in the QFT books, which is very simple and then useful in this story, which let me call it LSZ. LSZ in position space. Recall that the usual, uh, what is called usually uh, LSZ is uh, the way how you start with correlation functions and then, and then you get, uh, you get uh, scattering amplitudes by, by looking at the residues of the poles. And um, in this case, uh, we are working solely in uh, in the coordinate space, it would be useful to make a connection with the scattering amplitude to do something like LSZ in the coordinate space. And the way that you can do it is very simple. I will do it in two lines for, for free fields, and then this whole subject works uh, along, the same, along the same line. So imagine you have a Taylor field. I uh, pi's are equal uh, to correct coefficients to make these formulas work. 
I set them all to one or two or something. Then uh, this is a usual mode expansion of uh, field. And uh, A, here they satisfy, let me, let me I, I can absorb this factor into the definitions of A. And uh, then we have uh, usual commutation relation, which is, uh, I don't remember if there is this. And the three momentum. So this is a, simply the free field, quanti quantization of free, fi free field. And now the idea is uh, to take the free field and drag it to null infinity. Uh, we consider the following, uh, the following limit. Take a limit, <coughs> r going to infinity, uh, integral over the retarded time with some energy. And we consider the insertion at some retarded time, the distance uh, with some unit vector, let's say. Here what I did is I took this field and uh, insert it, I'm inserting it far away and uh, reading off the leading asymptotics in R and after integrating it with some wave function. Uh, well, you can plug this formula in this expression and it's uh, very easy to see. Yeah, the, the picture is that uh, we are taking the field, dragging it to null infinity, and then integrating over time with a wave function, which is simply e to the i omega u. And if you do this uh, computation, you'll find that uh, this becomes a creation operator. Um, well, let me write it as the absolute value of k. This energy, this creates, projects itself out into this creation operator at uh, future null infinity. Again, what I did is I took a field uh, and I uh, take the limit, and now if you plug this here, you get uh, this uh, projection. And uh, the direction of the momentum is encoded into where we drag the field in which direction, and the uh, energy is encoded in this wave function. Now we can take a correlation function. We can take a correlation function and start dragging fields to infinity and integrating them with this wave function. And in this way, uh, we will be able to turn the correlation function into the scattering amplitude. In this way, you can think of uh, scattering amplitudes as insertions at null infinity. And moreover, you can uh, uh, show that they transform, if you choose a proper factor, so derivatives, they transform like primary fields of two-dimensional CFT. And uh, you, can repeat the same, you can repeat the same thing for the, uh, for the metric and uh, take it to null infinity, and you will get uh, this kind of relation that, for example, uh, new stensor uh, at some frequency omega and z and z bar is related to the um, the energy of the photon times some simple kinematical factor and uh, well there is a let me write it like that, absolute value of omega. And uh, if omega is positive, it creates a photon in the direction z, z bar, or graviton in the direction z, z bar with energy omega. And if omega is negative, when we do a Fourier transform, it's a dagger, again with omega z, z bar. And uh, now we can take, uh, well, this is, a, this is a LSZ 
uh, prescriptions that we discuss here for scalar field. Now we can apply it to graviton. In this way, you can immediately, if you recall, the structure of the charge was that it has a piece which is linear in NZZ or in CZZ. Uh, this corresponds to creation of a, uh, of a soft photon. Well, maybe I should uh, once again uh, recall you the roughly the structure, for example, of QF. Uh, it has this du, and here there was a piece linear in NZZ, and then there was a piece quadratic in NZZ. Now you can uh, plug this in expressions, and you will find that this piece creates a particle on LHC particle, and this particle has a, a low frequency because we integrate against du with, uh, without any wave function. And this, uh, fine, or? Okay, let me proceed and see what happens. Okay, I, I restarted it, we'll see. <laughs> and this piece, uh, uh, which is quadratic in NZZ, it is, uh, it is a hard piece. You can see that it measures the flux of angular momentum or, uh, or, uh, or energy in the given direction. So that's it. In this way, in the very, in very pedestrian way, you can, uh, you can derive the action of these charges. You, you can check after plugging this A and A daggers that when you act on the, uh, on the fields, they, they, transform, they transform properly. Um, now, uh, let me, in the uh, last uh, five minutes, Yes? Okay, it works. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> let's uh, let's see. Um, I can proceed without it. It's uh, I can. Ah. Okay, uh, then I cannot use the blackboard. Uh, I, I can use that. Uh, um, yeah. Um. <laughs> oh no, it's the same, apparently. Oh, maybe maybe it was that. Okay, great. Um. <laughs> So far, it works. Well, okay. Soft theorems. Um, now we can uh, insert uh, these uh, charges into uh, into some uh, commutator with the S matrix, which was zero, if you remember, and see uh, and see what we get. Uh, so we consider some out state uh, commutator S and Q uh, in state, and this should be zero. And we get uh, first what is known as a um, Weinberg soft theorem, which is, um, I already wrote it. Well, I, it's a statement that if you take a limit of a scattering amplitude with n plus one particle and you take the energy of one particle to zero, uh, if some some graviton, some momenta, uh, you get uh, some of I polarization of this graviton, P I mu, P I nu, uh, P dot Q. Well, let, let me take this Q. Q is a, omega is the absolute value of uh, Q. So it's a moment, for momentum Q mu. And... Uh, um, 
times an amplitude of with n particles. Well, that's all known. One nice uh, peculiar formula, peculiar or simple fact about this formula is that if you do a gauge transformation, which is um, this, then uh, the invariance, uh, you can plug this formula and we see that for, for it to be gauge invariant, uh, we need uh, the energy momentum conservation. I should be equal to zero. And uh, for the subleading uh, soft theorem, this is, uh, this is uh, something very concrete and very new, which came out, I guess, of this, of this analysis, because people didn't know, even though there was some works, but I think uh, it's definitely people didn't know about uh, this subleading soft theorem, which uh, takes the following form. Yeah, it takes the same amplitude, but now it takes the limit omega d omega. Notice that this operator projects out one over omega piece, which is the divergence here. If you act with this on this, it's zero. Uh, of the amplitude is equal to um, the following expression. Sum of I, I, epsilon, mu, mu, lambda, J, I. And, uh, this uh, J is, uh, now it's an operator which acts on a lower dimensional amplitude and it, uh, it, it, it just measures the total angular momentum of a particle. So it is a orbital momentum plus a helicity part. Again, if you do the gauge transformation on this object, you will find that uh, the consistency, the, its gauge invariants require that the total angular momentum is conserved. Um, this is what is no, uh, this is uh, known as a, a subleading soft uh, soft theorem for gravitons. Now uh, let me have to I'm out of time, so, and that's a time to uh, finish with some comments. First comment is the following: Imagine we consider uh, and some effective field theory, and uh, well, as we imagine, we have Einstein theory plus some high derivative corrections. And uh, you can add matter with all kind of interactions. For example, we can consider R, mu, nu, rho sigma, F, mu, rho sigma, or we can consider phi, Riemann, Riemann square, etc. You can do the analysis uh, similar to the soft theorems uh, for most generic effective field theory. And it was done by Henriette Elving and her collaborators, which I don't remember the names. And you can show that this uh, leading and uh, subleading theorem is completely intact. So they're completely universal for any theory. That's the first result. Whereas if you go to further orders in one over omega, say sub subleading theorem, this gets corrected from this high derivative terms. Um, this is uh, in accord with uh, this universality structure of the symmetries that we discussed. That they should be, uh, this is uh, the picture that should be valid in any theory. Second is uh, if you consider quantum corrections, then you find that, uh, say, leading. Uh, uh, Leading soft theorem uh, is always stays the same. Le le leading soft theorem is not corrected. It's not corrected. But uh, you see that the subleading theorem, soft theorem, is one loop. 
is corrected only at one loop. And uh, <coughs> sub sub leading is corrected only up to two loops. Uh, now these corrections due to infrared divergences are singular and there is a whole different discussion about how to think about this, how to discuss infrared fineness as metrics and what is the meaning of this, uh, uh, this extra charges which are sort of anomalous, uh, um, how to think about them, etc., etc. Um, uh, yes, and I guess uh, the, uh, and, well, there are other directions uh, which, yeah. maybe uh, let me stop here, yeah, thanks.